All right, my name is Hannah Chulik. I'm the PGY2 uh, geriatric pharmacy resident here at the South Texas VA. Um, I did my undergrad in uh, College of Pharmacy work at UT Austin, and then last year I did my PGY1 at the in Little Rock, Arkansas, at the VA there in Little Rock. And today I'm going to talk about the management of inappropriate sexual behavior in dementia elderly patients. First, I want to start off with the case. Uh, Mr. J.W. is a 69-year-old male with dementia secondary to an anoxic brain injury. His past medical history includes hypertension, atrial fibrillation, CAD, depression, and dementia. His inappropriate sexual behavior includes um, inappropriately touching females, mainly uh, female family members and female friends. He's also had incidences of exposing himself in public, uh, one example was when he was going to adult daycare, he exposed himself to the female bus driver, and so he could no longer go to daycare anymore. And these behaviors have been have become problematic for his family, um, wanting to go out to social situations, as well as female family members not being comfortable being around him um, alone. So I just want to introduce, introduce him to you, and we're going to go back to him later in the presentation, but just think about him and the difficulty um, his family may be having with dealing with these behaviors. The objectives for today's presentation is to define inappropriate sexual behavior and what are the causes of it, to describe behavioral interventions of inappropriate sexual behavior as well as pharmacologic interventions and the side effects that go along with those interventions. And also recognize ethical dilemmas to consider um, for treatment decisions of inappropriate sexual behavior. First, I just want to start off with an overview of the three common dementias. There are many other dementias that could cause inappropriate sexual behavior, but I'm not going to talk about those today. Uh, the ones I am going to focus more on is Alzheimer's disease, dementia with Lewy bodies, and vascular dementia. So Alzheimer's disease has multiple hypothesized theories behind the cause. Uh, one common is the neuritic plaques and neurofibrillary tangles that develop, as well as degeneration of neurons and synapses. Uh, some common characteristics include uh, the memory loss, especially impaired executive function, and um, they lose functional ability, they lose the ability to do their um, activities of daily living. Dementia with Lewy bodies has Lewy bodies that are present in specific areas of the brain, and some common clinical characteristics is that they have cognitive fluctuation, uh, fluctuations or episodes. They also often have hallucinations and delusions, and can uh, develop Parkinsonism, and uh, they're very sensitive to neuroleptics. And then finally, vascular dementia, which is associated with cerebral vascular disease, and these patients usually have a history of strokes. Some characteristics include the cognitive loss, but usually it's early and severe decline of executive function, as well as gait disturbances, and often personality and mood changes. Some of you may be wondering what exactly is inappropriate sexual behavior. Um, and so we're going to discuss that now and see what kind of definitions are actually in the literature. There's quite a few that have been reported. The most common is persistent, uninhibited sexual behaviors directed towards oneself or others. And usually this can cause distress or disturbance with close relationships and with caregivers. It's been categorized into two, two different categories, an intimacy seeker or a disinhibited behavior. And an intimacy seeker would have maybe normal behaviors, but not in the nor uh, not correct for the social context, so like kissing and hugging. hugging. But uh, disinhibited behaviors would have inappropriate behaviors in most social contexts, so vulgarity, exhibitionism, um, groping. There's actually different types of hypersexual behavior. Uh, sex talk, implied sexual acts, and sexual acts. And the most common is sex talk, so vulgar language. Implied sexual acts include uh, reading pornographic material in public or requesting unnecessary uh, genital care. Sexual acts include groping inappropriately, uh, masturbating.
between in public exhibitionism um, fondly. So you might be wondering, well, how common are these actual behaviors in demented patients? There was a retrospective review of over 100 patients that were admitted to a Jarrah psychiatry unit, and the prevalence reported here was 15%. They looked at the types of dementias that those patients had, and they found that the vascular dementia was most common with Alzheimer's disease being the second most common. That would be like a long-term care unit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is not community dwelling. No. no. Right. Just yes. Mm -hmm. There was another retrospective cross-sectional study looking at similar outcomes. Uh, they reviewed over 2,000 charts. And this, again, is not in the community, so this is in um, like long-term care setting. And they found the prevalence to be only about 2%. So if you look at different literature, the prevalence varies um, from different studies. They also looked at the age of these patients, and 60% were 65 to 80 years old, and about 40% were uh, uh, greater than 8 years old. They look at, looked at gender, and they found that the majority of those patients that had ISP were males and more than females. Again, the etiology, uh, there was more vascular dementia Second, again, was Alzheimer's disease. And then the types of behaviors, there was physical and verbal inappropriate behavior, but most of the patients, if they had some type of ISP, um, they had both types of behaviors. So we've discussed that dementia is, can be related to causing these, um, causing ISP, the inappropriate sexual behavior, but maybe what's going on that, um, what's the link between the two? So there are changes in the central nervous system that may be causing it. Uh, one is in the frontal cortex, which can cause disinhibition. In the temporal limbic system, um, it can cause hypersexual behavior. And the striatum is uh, connected with obsessive compulsive behavior, so the patient's behaviors could be um, sexual related, but could be obsessive compulsive types of behaviors. And then the hypothalamus can also cause an increase in sexual desire or hypersexuality. Besides just changes in the CNS, um, endocrine factors play a role in sexual function. So one of those is testosterone. It influences both male and female um, sex function. And it's been shown that rapid withdrawal in males can lead to a decrease in sexual interest. For estrogen, it plays a smaller role in sexual function in both uh, males and females, but there, there has been shown that high levels can decrease uh, sexual function in males. And progesterone has really shown um, in studies not to be that big of a factor for sexual function. There are multiple neurotransmitters that are part of sexual function, but I'm only going to focus on two that uh, will, when I talk about different agents, will kind of uh, factor into that. So serotonin and dopamine. There's actually, uh, most of serotonin's receptors are 95% are in the periphery, and so uh, activation there can lead to smooth muscle vasodilation or vasoconstriction in the sexual organs. And dopamine increases can increase sexual desire. But this has mainly been shown in males, there's not a lot of research in females. So the two kind of work together in summary that low CNS serotonin and high dopamine can increase sexual desire. And then the opposite would be true if there's uh, low dopamine and high serotonin that would decrease sexual function. Medications can also play a role in ISD. One of those being dopamine agonists, which you may see for uh, patients with Parkinson's. The proposed mechanism behind that is the increase of dopamine. And it's been shown that the direct dopamine agonists, such as Rupiterol or Bromocryptine, play a larger role. As I said, dopamine agonists are often used in Parkinson's patients, and so there's been a couple of case series um, done looking to see do those patients develop hypersexual behavior or ISP. And they're the two largest ones were both with uh, 15 patients each. In one, 14 of the 15 patients developed hypersexual behavior and it developed within eight months. And in another one, seven of the 15, and these were all, all these patients were on direct dopamine agonist um, therapeutic or high dose. 
when those drugs were reduced dose-wise or discontinued, then the symptoms uh, went away. And so there is a possible dose-related um, relationship between the behaviors and the dose of the dopamine agonist, but it hasn't really been defined in the literature. Additional medications such as alcohol and benzodiazepines can cause disinhibition, and stimulants have been also linked to be causing an increased libido. There's a lot of causes. Um, as you can see, in, next we're going to go into, well, what can you do now? You know what kind of cause, what can cause it, and one, what the link is maybe with dementia, but what types of interventions can you do? There's two main ones I'm going to talk about, which are behavioral interventions and pharmacologic interventions. And the majority of all the evidence will be case reports, because that's the level of evidence that has been published. For the pharmacologic interventions, I'm going to talk about antidepressants, antipsychotics, hormonal agents, and anticonvulsants. And in your handout, um, there's a list of all the case reports. There have been additional agents that do not fall in these categories that have been reported, but I'm not going to discuss those in detail, but you can see them in the handout. And for each of the different types of agents, I'm only going to highlight a couple of cases, but the full list of cases are in the handout. So for behavioral interventions, it's important to not only consider the patient, but also their caregivers and family. So if you think back to the patient we introduced in the beginning, Mr. J.W., it was very difficult for the family to deal with his behaviors. So their um, supportive psychotherapy may be helpful with teaching the family, as well as making them you know, realize that it's not a reflection of their relationship with the patient. For the patient, there's different interventions that, behavioral interventions that can be done or tried. Um, some include redis redirection, distraction, or sensory stimulation. Um, redirection, if they're saying something that's inappropriate, redirect them into um, you know, talking about a different topic. If it's um, they're bored, or you want to keep them activated, so keep them um, stimulated. If they often just probe in public, give them something to do activities, or if it's even holding towels or doing an arts and crafts. If there's certain social situations that trigger those behaviors. So if they're in a nursing facility, um, if it's at meal time to separate them from um, another resident that maybe trigger those behaviors or give them the same sex uh, caregiver as well. If they have a partner um, to allow for privacy with the partner or even privacy to themselves as well. And then another interesting one I think is clothing. If they often disrobe um, is to use Clothing that fastens in the back, and they call it like a back flap, which the cartoon depicts, it would be in the other direction, but it's just a kind of a, I guess, easy intervention to do to keep them from undressing out in public. There's not a lot of evidence reported in the literature about the effectiveness of behavioral interventions, but there has been a case report and a case controlled study. Uh, the case report was a 68 year old male with Alzheimer's disease, and his inappropriate sexual behaviors mainly surrounded um, inappropriately touching female uh, staff and female residents where he lived. He was given a toy. It was a Pink Panther stuffed toy and those behaviors became less intrusive towards other residents and staff members and towards more of the toy and it was more tolerable for the facility. That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> the case control study it was actually two different groups. There was a control group that had uh, normal care, and then the intervention group consisted of a nurse and clinical psychologist, which they would make an individualized plan for each patient and a, an extensive assessment to analyze the behaviors and come up with a plan. And they looked at what type of interventions those patients received. And the intervention group actually received more behavioral interventions. 77% uh, versus in the control group, um, which they only received about 9% of the psychosocial interventions. And it was effective in the intervention group in reducing behaviors, 44% um, reduction of the behaviors. There wasn't a statistical significance reported, but it seems like that would be clinically relevant. There are 
limitations to doing behavioral interventions. You have to think about the patient population. So reduced ability to learn and remember what you've taught them before. Also, poor education um, and training of staff and caregivers as well. But the strengths of behavioral interventions is the no adverse effects, and it's very non-invasive. So now I'm going to talk about pharmacologic interventions. And first I want to discuss antidepressants, but mainly SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And the mechanism um, behind those is the effects they have on serotonin, increasing the serotonin, as well as the anti-obsessional type effects. The side effects most commonly with those agents are GI, or nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Um, some have a high risk of QTC prolongation that you may want to, uh, that you want to consider but overall they're usually pretty well tolerated. For the cases, and table one lists all the cases with, with those agents, the majority of them are with citalopram, uh, 20 milligrams daily, and I just want to highlight a couple of the cases. There was a 55-year-old male with Alzheimer's disease who had, was having greater than 20 sexual outlets per week, and that was all a masturbation. He was started on denepazil, 10 milligrams daily, and after a month, he was reevaluated and the behaviors had it reduced. So then he was then started on citalopram and increased up to 40 milligrams daily. And after a two month evaluation after the citalopram, his um, sexual outlets reduced to less than two per week. And so that was tolerable for the family. And at 12 months, his behaviors uh, were maintained. Another case was with an 85-year-old male with vascular dementia and Alzheimer's disease. He was on memantine and rivastigmine. He suffered um, symptoms suggestive of a stroke, and after that, he developed interest in adult porn pornography as well as started collecting adult DVDs and toys. And he, the family found these and hid them, or took them away from him and hid them from him, and he became very obsessed with finding them, and he lost interest in his hobbies he used to have. He was started on citalopram 20 milligrams daily, and at the seventh month follow-up, his behaviors reported by the family had reduced, and he was no longer worried about trying to find those DVDs and toys that had gone back to um, his normal ho hobbies that he previously was interested in. Another group of agents are hormonal agents that can be used for ISV, and that includes anti-androgens and estrogens. The anti-androgens includes medroxy progesterone acetate, or MPA as I'll refer to it, or cyproterone acetate CPA. I just want to note here that CPA is not available in the U.S., so I'll discuss it some, but I won't go into great detail. Um, the most common used estrogens include ethanol estradiol, conjugated estrogens, and diethyl strobestrol. And another important thing to remember about the hormonal agents is their mechanism of how they work is very controversial, and I'll discuss that more um, in detail later in the presentation, but sometimes it's referred to as chemical castration. So MPA and CPA, or the anti-androgens, work by reducing testosterone levels. They affect the luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormones to reduce testosterone. They work pretty similar when comparing the two. Um, CPA does have some receptor level activity, but otherwise, they're, they're pretty similar. Since they lower testosterone levels, it's been proposed that maybe following testosterone levels will help you determine what dose to use for these agents. Um, proposed goals is a 90% reduction in testosterone or to reduce testosterone levels to a level of a female. Though, in the, all the cases I reviewed, not many people always actually follow that. It hasn't totally um, been determined exactly you know, what would be the goal. There are a lot of side effects with these medications to remember. The ones I've highlighted in yellow are either most common or more serious. Uh, that includes depression, diabetes, thromboembolism, decreased bone <coughs> mineral, mineral density, and cardiovascular disorders. And there are contraindications when using these agents if they have a history of thromboembolism. The full list of case reports is in table two. I'm only going to highlight a couple from a case series. 
There was an 81-year-old male with Alzheimer's disease who had inappropriate sexual behavior, including touching female staff and female family and residents. That he was started on sertraline and on quetiapine with no reduction in his behaviors. And then he was started on MPA 100 milligrams every two weeks and then increased to 500 milligrams IM um, every week. And those, it was reported that his ISB was completely stopped and that one year those behaviors were maintained. Another patient was a 68-year-old male with vascular dementia with behaviors including public masturbation, uh, touching females inappropriately, and even an incident of getting in another resident's bed. He had a trial of various medications in different combinations, including quetiapine, trazodone, valproic acid, and risperidone. And none of, none of those seemed to decrease his behaviors. And he was started on MPA, uh, 300 milligrams IM weekly. And it was reported that his behaviors as well stopped completely. And they, there was no um, follow-up of how long um, the behaviors had stopped. Another patient was an 81-year-old male with dementia, not, not otherwise specified, that had behaviors including uh, touching female staff and residents and even um, one incident of intercourse with another resident. The patient was on denepazil, 10 milligrams every night in quetiapine, and his behaviors did not change or reduce, and so he was started on MPA 300 milligrams IM weekly, and then increased to 500 milligrams uh, IM weekly, which reported completely eliminated his ISD. And those behaviors were maintained over here. What about Selexa? Like that was not tried in one of these cases. Did you say Selexa? Um, I think that was the first. The Talibran? Mm -hmm. And the ones before with the anti You mean like for these patients? Yeah. For yeah, it wasn't patients. reported. So these okay. were the only ones that reported that were used. So as you'll see as I go through them, um, it's always a bunch of different combinations. It doesn't ever seem to be like the same ones that are always tried. So that's one of the challenges too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, these are the only ones that reported in the case reports. Okay. Yeah. So estrogen is another hormonal agent. Acts similarly to the antiandrogens and that it decreases testosterone. Again, it's important just to remember the side effects. So some of the um, side effects I've highlighted in yellow are more serious ones, the cardiovascular disorders and thromboembolism. And again, it has some contraindications as well if they have a past history of thromboembolism. And the case reports for all the estrogen cases are in table three, but I'm just going to highlight one case of a 78-year-old uh, male <coughs> with vascular dementia. And the ISV was mainly towards female staff, um, sex talk, and um, inappropriately touching. He was on risperidone, uh, lorazepam, and on haloperidol as needed. Oh, uh -huh. They obtained consent to start the conjugated <coughs> um, estrogen, and he started on that. And about a month and a half later, there was reports of marked improvement of his behavior. And at five months, it was reported there was a 80 percent uh, improvement in his sexual aggression, as well as a 55 percent decrease in his sexual comments. Um. So all of these patients are mostly men? Yes, know? I'll have one that's a female, but the majority of the case reports uh, were in males. That. Mm -hmm. Another group of agents are antipsychotics, and I'll mainly focus on <coughs> atypical antipsychotics. There's a couple of cases with uh, typical antipsychotics, but majority of the time it's atypical antipsychotics. And they have dopamine blocking effects. Um, Decreasing the dopamine to help decrease, uh, to help decrease uh, sexual uh, desire. There is a lot of side effects with antipsychotics, and the ones highlighted are the serious ones. You want to consider extraperianal symptoms, the QTC prolongation, and metabolic changes. As well, there is a black box warning. When using these agents, and increased mortality in elderly patients with demented. Uh, Dementia-related psychosis, so it's something to remember when starting this agent. One 
case was with an 85-year-old male with dementia, not otherwise specified, who had attempted sexual relations um, multiple times with his wife. Whenever he was denied, he'd become very angry and um, masturbate for several hours. He was actually started on CPA. It was only a two-week trial. And then also paroxetine, which he had a side effect to. And then he was started on quetiapine, 25 milligrams at bedtime, which it was reported that his behavior stopped after two days and that there was no recurrence at two months. So this is the one of the female patient, a um, 61-year-old female with dementia with Lewy bodies, who had increased expression of sexual wishes towards female family as well as inappropriate touching. She was on levodopa and carbidopa, olanzapine, and memantine, and none of these agents decreased her behavior. She was started on quetiapine up to 75 milligrams per day, and it was reported that there was a reduction after seven days. And at the one month follow up, this was maintained as reported by the family. And to note, all the antipsychotics that I found in the case reports didn't have, uh, didn't report follow up past two months of how long the behaviors had been maintained. And then finally, um, anticonvulsants have been looked at for treating ISB. The one I'm mainly going to focus on is gabapentin. The mechanism is really not known of what role or what it's doing to affect ISB, but one proposed is the change it can cause in different monoamine transmitters. Usually, gabapentin is pretty well tolerated. Uh, most common side effects are like drowsiness um, or gastrointestinal effects. You also have to remember there's a dose reduction needed for renal impairment, and so usually in older patients, uh, there's some type of renal impairment. The full list of case reports is in Table 5, but I just want to discuss a case and then a small case series. So one was with a 76-year-old male with Alzheimer's disease. His uh, behaviors include exposing himself and inappropriately touching females, as well as public masturbation. He was on quetiapine, and that did not do anything to his behaviors, and he was admitted into a nursing facility, which they tried behavioral interventions, which uh, did not reduce his behaviors either. He was then started on gabapentin, up to 300 milligrams three times a day, and reported that his ISV completely resolved and that it was maintained at six months. There was a small case series of three patients, two with Alzheimer's disease, one with vascular dementia, and there was inappropriate sexual behavior with no response to behavioral in intervention. So they didn't report they were on any other agents, but they tried behavioral interventions first. And they were then started on gabapentin. Uh, they gave a range of 1,800 to 2,700 milligrams per day. And all of the patients did have a decrease in their behaviors. Two of them had a marked improvement, and one had total resolution of symptoms. And that was all maintained at six months. So I showed this picture in the beginning. So I'm just going to review um, how those kind of correlate with some of the agents that I spoke about. So we talked about uh, SSRIs, and so that works with the serotonin as well as some of the um, obsessional components. And also, atypical antipsychotics work on both dopamine and serotonin, and that's how they um, can work to help decrease inappropriate sexual behaviors. Anticonvulsants, not really sure exactly the mechanism behind it. And then with the hormonal agents, those work on um, LH and FSH um, to decrease testosterone. So I've talked a lot about case series and case reports. That's mainly that's all in the in the literature. There was a retrospective chart review done in 2011, and the purpose was really to identify potential contributing factors of what could be um, causing the ISB or maybe certain characteristics of the patients and then to review what type of interventions they were on and if those were effective. There were two groups. There was the study group and then a matched control group. It was matched on gender, age, and on marital status. They didn't match it on the severity of dementia or uh, the type of dementia as that hasn't been um, 
the relationship there hasn't been totally determined. And to be included into the study, the patients had to be admitted into this um, certain unit in the last three years and had to have, as one of their problems, inappropriate sexual behaviors listed in the medical chart. And over three years, um, when they looked at the data, they only had uh, 10 patients. The average age was 76 years old, and uh, there were more males than females. When looking at the diagnosis of dementia, all the patients with the ISB in the study group had dementia compared to um, half or five in the study group. And if you look at vascular dementia, it wasn't statistically significant, but it did um, trend towards vascular dementia as being more prominent in the study group versus the control group. So I looked at the history of stroke. And not only if the patients had a stroke, but where the stroke was located. So if you had, they had a right frontal stroke that was um, significant compared to the matched group, where um, six patients out of the eight patients that had a stroke in the study group, um, compared to only to no patients had a right frontal stroke in this um, control group, where there was a total of four stroke patients. And then the Minty Mental State Exam showed that the patients in the study group had a more severe dementia with lower scores. I'm going to look at what type of treatment those patients were receiving. Um, you can see here that there's antidepressants, um, atypical antipsychotics, <coughs> hormonal agents, uh, mood stabilizers. But one thing to remember is that the patients weren't all on just one agent. They're on a combination of agents. So it makes it very hard to determine which agent was having the most effect. And the duration of the agents all uh, varied uh, from five days to 11 weeks. So there wasn't any, any consistency in that. When looking at effectiveness, uh, the authors, it was either reported as um, complete resolution, some reduction, or no uh, reduction. And None of the agents or combination of agents caused complete resolution. Um, most of them had some reduction, and then there were some where there was no um, decrease in behaviors noted. They also looked at adverse events. And there were a couple of patients that had to stop therapy due to side effects. Um, one being with citalopram of worsening the ISB. Uh, there were side effects with both olanzapine and risperidone causing them to stop due to um, sedation, PPS, worsening of ISB, or neuroleptic malignant syndrome. And um, there were other side effects reported with MPA or luprolide, but um, did not have to stop there. So the authors concluded that based on their observations that there's a higher association with ISB if the patients have a diagnosis of vascular dementia, if they have had a right frontal uh, lobe stroke, and if they have more severe dementia. Their conclusion on the type of interventions that were used, they thought that citalopram was well tolerated but didn't seem as effective, that atypical antipsychotics were moderately effective but they had a lot of side effects, and that hormonal agents were well tolerated and effective. They also reported that they thought you know, ISP was really underreported in the medical charts and that they only found 10 patients. And so it was most likely an underreported treatable um, problem. What I took from this was that it just adds to the little evidence there is available in the literature. There's a lot of limitations to it. It was very small, it was retrospective, they didn't um, correct statistically for multiple comparisons. And again, the agents were used in combination, so it wasn't just one agent they were looking at. So it's hard to determine which one was really having the effect. And just to review overall the evidence available for interventions for treating ISB. Behavioral interventions are often not well described in the literature. There was only one case report and a case control study. Majority of the evidence is all case reports, and usually only positive case reports are published. And uh, most of the residents were on multiple agents, multiple psychoactive agents, even in the case reports, so it's hard to determine what was really helping. 
There's no randomized controlled trials that look at safety, efficacy, or um, the appropriate dose as well. There's no trials that are comparing different agents. I've talked a lot about treatment, and so now we're going to switch gears a little bit to um, something else that's important to think about if you're thinking about to treat and then what you would choose. So there's some ethical dilemmas that you may face um, when deciding this. So I'm going to pose a couple of questions and have a little bit of interactive with y'all. Um, so should a resident be allowed to have a sexual relationship? Any yeses? Depends. So not sure. Or no. Anyone think no? Or someone thinking, why are you asking that question? Because they're old. Say yes. With the the right, so we'll talk about that as well. Um, she said the ability to consent, so I'll get into that more. Mm -hmm. um, so some people think, well, if you get older, you don't have any sexual relationships, which is uh, hasn't been true. It reported that um, 50 to 90 year olds, actually 80 percent of those, are sexually active, and even into the I read into the seventh and eighth decade, um, they're at least sexually active once a month. And STD rates have actually gone up, I would say, over the last year in uh, more in uh, community, uh, not community settings, in like, nursing homes and stuff like that. Um, nursing homes, long-term care. And if anyone watches Parks and Recreation, anyone? There was an episode about giving um, a safe, se safe sex talk in a nursing home. So I just thought that was interesting, even, you know, on a popular show, they were talking about it. So should two demented persons and one demented and one non-demented person be allowed to participate in a sexual relationship? I see no. Maybe it depends. It depends. It depends. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I actually have a patient who has a lady with Alzheimer's and assisted living who has a I mean, boyfriend who's also living in some way. And it's like, they're so happy. You know? They really are. It's like, yeah. Yeah. So one thing yeah. I want to talk about yeah. what, what you brought up was the, yeah. ca the capacity to yeah. consent. Um, so usually in general when you think of capacity consent, it includes the voluntary participation, a mental competence, and the awareness of the risks and benefits of it, of whatever you're talking about. And there's been some actually articles in literature about how to determine if they have the capacity to consent to a sexual relationship. And so are they aware of the relationship? Do they know who the other person is or do they think it's someone else? Are they, a, a, do they have the ability to avoid exploitation? Can they say no? Can they state what level of intimacy they're comfortable with? And are they aware of the potential risks? So if the relationship ends, and if this is in a nursing home setting or a long-term setting, you know, if the other patient leaves, or do they know how they'll feel? Can they state that? So those are all things you can consider when um, trying to determine if they have the capacity for those types of relationships. And then, does restricting a resident's sexual expression follow federal regulations which mandate as least restrictive as possible institutional care? Yes? No? I don't know, maybe. Yeah. So, the <coughs> U.S. Residence Bill of Rights says you, know, you have to maintain the resident's autonomy and their right to sexual expression. We also have to balance this um, with the risk for physical or mental harm to themselves or to, you know, depending where they are, other residents, staff. So it's a balancing um, between the patient's uh, rights and then causing harm to others. And this goes along with the next question, does chemical castration with hormonal agents violate the human rights of the patient? Yes? Maybe. Um, so that is hard to determine, and it's not really clear. Without but, consent. Without consent. It right. So the, it's important if you're going to start these agents that you have consent um, of who, you know, who consents for that patient, um, whoever that is. And then again, it's balancing the rights. You know, if it's you have to really look at the types of behaviors that are going on if they're causing harm um, to the patient or, or to other people. Um, to balance those rights, but it's important um, to get the consent. And even on two of the case reports, I didn't talk about them, but they're in uh, 
the table with the MPA. It was actually therapy when state regulars came in to a um, nursing facility, they stopped that therapy um, due to that. I've looked at um, Texas's and it's like very, it's very vague exactly what they determine. It kind of all goes under um, chemical restraints. So there's not, I couldn't find a section that was very specific. So I don't know if it, and it does vary from state to state as well. So in summary, I discussed there's lots of causes of ISV. Behavioral interventions can be effective, but they require extra time and training. There's multiple pharmacologic agents that have been looked at in the literature, but there's very little evidence as it's all case reports. Uh, the elderly population is at a higher risk of side effects, so that's something to keep in mind when starting um, a medication. As well, there's a lot of multi uh, ethical dilemmas to consider if you're going to treat and then what agent you would use. So as I was looking at this, I think it's really important to weigh the risk versus benefit. And as there is no agent with significant level of evidence available in the literature, I think it's really important to consider safety when you're going to start an agent. And for me, I prefer to use an oral agent over IM just as for quality of life of the patient. I would first try behavioral interventions. Again, it's non-invasive, there's no side effects, but the caregivers and staff need to have extra treatment. Um, second line would be pharmacologic interventions. I would start with SSR SSRIs as they've been shown to be effective and they're well tolerated and uh, safe. Then I would choose either an atypical antipsychotic or a gabapentin, and that would depend if the patient was also having other behavioral um, issues going on, which uh, the atypical antipsychotic may help. And then I would probably third line would be the hormonal agents, and that would be based on kind of the ethical dilemma with that, with the chemical castration, as well as all the case reports that I looked at um, used at the higher dose, which is the Depo-Provera, and is the IM injection. I want to go back to JW, who I talked about earlier, and see what, what he got. So we talked about antidepressants, and he got he, a trial of a bunch of different antidepressants, as well as carbamazepine, and he was on denepazil, lomantine, glantamine. These were all in different combinations, so not one than the next, but in different combinations. And he had periods of um, complete resolution of ISD throughout using the different combinations. And eventually he was tried on um, hormonal agents. And um, they, he went up to 30 milligrams per day was his um, highest dose. And they did look at the testosterone levels and they decreased about 50% over about a six month period. And one challenge with him was that he received, um, this was a patient at the VA, they also went to outside providers so he would come in and out. So it's hard to determine exactly um, you know, what he was always taking and it was changing very often. And he also had apathy throughout um, the course of therapy, so in side effects to other medications, so that was a challenge as well to determine what would work. Uh, most recently what I saw, he was on galantamine and citalopram, and he seems to be doing okay with that, with uh, not a lot of behaviors coming up. But I think he's just a good case to show how challenging it is to treat them, and then how disruptive that can be for family members as well, not only with the patient. And now for any questions. Um, not many of the case reports um, addressed females. Mm -hmm. yeah. I could tell you a story when I was uh, younger. <laughs> I, I worked at a nursing home as a, like a kind of re recreation, and I get hit on by all. <laughs> and it wasn't because of me. It was because that's what um, they would say very inappropriate things. But I don't know how far they took it. So, like what I what I read in the literature is that. Some places think, or studies that looked at, they found it was higher in males than some say it's about the same. It was just all the case reports seemed to be um, with male, with males. And I did limit the case reports to <coughs> patients that had dementia and that were older and looking more at um, those three types of dementias that I, um, Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, and dementia with Lewy bodies. Um, there's some other um, more rare diseases, I guess, that can also cause this, but I did look into those. Um, so I don't know if that's where the case reports were there. But yeah, they it's because like most of the staff in those facilities are female and are just targeted. Yeah. You're the only guy. Yeah, you're the only male. <laughs> I was the only <laughs> recreational <laughs> specialist <laughs> male there. <Yeah. laughs> um, I had an interesting thing, and I, I looked at case reports. I looked this up 
was just with the cholinesterase inhibitors, but they don't make that better generally, and there are case reports of them making it way, way worse. Uh, so just something to be aware of. It's, like I said, there's never been a case series, but I've found in because I had a patient where we fixed, we really helped his cognition with Aristep, but his, his, he had these just emergence of terrible disinhibitive sexual behaviors, mm -hmm. and a cure of his 20-year history of erectile dysfunction which was really a bad combination uh, <laughs> in, a, in a guy with Alzheimer's. Uh, uh, you know, and so, and it was the RSF. So, yeah. And, and, and there are case reports of women and men in nursing homes getting sexually disinhibited on colon and stress inhibitors. So you think about... Did you write it up? It could no, be a new indication to. for Arisa. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bunch of middle-aged people. Think. <laughs> but um, but if you think about how all of that works, it actually makes sense yeah. uh, that that might happen. Uh, so just something to do Do you have questions or comments?